From the mechanical energy balance, it's going to be possible for us to work out the flow rate through a pipe. The first way we're going to look at that is if we have a constriction in the pipe, and that will either be through a orifice meter, a venturi meter, or using a nozzle. So from the mechanical energy balance, as we've got in front of us, what we're going to do is we're going to firstly assume that we have a very small section of pipe, and in that section of pipe we have no pump, so Ws is going to be zero. Because it's so small, the small section of pipe, we're also going to assume that there is no friction. If we then simplify that and expand the integral, we're left with gz plus velocity squared on 2 for the out, plus gz, sorry, it's equal to gz plus velocity squared on 2 in, plus the two pressure terms divided by the density. We'll move the velocity in from the right-hand side onto the left, and we're left with everything else on the right. Now, unfortunately for this term, we are going to see that we are looking for the velocity, and the first thing you'll notice is that there are two velocities in this term, and we've only got one equation, so we're going to have to look at doing something else. So how we're going to do that is to now incorporate a mass balance. We'll look at the mass in and the mass out across that small section of pipe as per the mechanical energy balance equation above equation 1. So we'll start with mass in is equal to mass out. We can then rewrite that as rho VA, so on the left hand side rho V in A in is equal to rho V out A out. Because the density is the same, it's the same fluid going in and out, we will cross out the density terms. And we will rewrite that as V in is equal to V out, multiplied by A out divided by A in. And we can use that to then substitute that into the equation 1, which was the equation that we had earlier at the top of the page now, the mechanical energy balance. So when we substitute that into the equation, we had a V in term as our second term on the left. That has now been replaced by the V out A out squared divided by 2 and the A in squared term as from the mass balance. We can then factor the velocity term out. So we have the V squared term on the left hand side coming out. We only have one term for V out. We can then make another assumption that this pipe is at a constant height because it's a small section of pipe. So the difference in Z is going to be zero which will mean that the z in minus z out term will fall away. We can then simplify it further and just have the v, v out squared on the left is equal to the 2 multiplied by the bracket term on the top divided by 1 minus the a out divided by a in squared term on the bottom. And finally we can get rid of the squared term and we can square root everything on the right hand side so we simply have a, an equation for v out as our final equation 3. What we now want to look at is an example of how to use this, and the example we're going to have here is the orifice meter. So what we have for the orifice meter is going to be a pipe, and this is the section we said that is at constant height, where the fluid is going to flow, in this example, let's just say from the left to the right down the length of this pipe. An orifice meter is now a device such that the area is going to change. So when we look at it from the left hand side, or a cross section like this rather, it looks like that. It's just a restriction to the flow. If I had to stick my head down the pipe and look at it down the pipe, there's that circle at the bottom, you would see a smaller hole in the middle, and that shaded section in the top pipe is the same as this shaded section here. So it's a bit of a donut shape. It's squeezing the flow so that it's a smaller flow through the pipe. As the fluid comes towards the orifice meter, it's now going to get restricted. So the flow pattern is going to come towards the orifice meter, so it's going to get constricted. It's going to get constricted and the flow is actually going to come through to a narrower point after the orifice meter. And then it is going to again come through and return to its normal flow. And at some point down the pipe, it is going to return to the same flow pattern as you had at the beginning. We're now going to look at different points in this pipe, and we're going to start by labeling them as point 1. We're going to have point 0 or point 0. My notes, they confuse the two a bit, so just watch out for that. We're going to have point 2, and we're going to have point 3. So point 1 is the point where the flow is still normal. It hasn't been affected yet by the orifice plate. Point O is the orifice plate, point 2 is the vena contractor, which is going to be where the flow is at its, or the area is at its most narrow, 
and it's also going to be whether velocity is the fastest, and point three is the, the point further down the pipe where the flow returns back to normal. If you recall in the notes, we needed to know the pressure. So in order to calculate the pressure, we are now going to add a YouTube manometer. So we'll do that between point one and point two. So at that point, we can now have a mercury or some other manometer so we can measure the pressure across the orifice meter. Neatening up the diagram, there we have it again for points 1, 0, or 0, 2, and 3, as well as our YouTube manometer across the orifice plate. For each of those points, as we said, it's the point before the orifice plate, the orifice plate itself, the vena contractor. It's a point after the orifice plate where the pressure and density equal the original pressure. And just as a rule of thumb, just to note, in order for this to work, orifice plates generally work best if they are 50 times the diameter, so sorry, the orifice plate is 50 times the diameter away from any other fitting. So that would be a bend, a valve, or anything else. And in general, the pipe should be at least 150 millimeters in diameter to allow for turbulent flow conditions, which is, which, which is what we need for the orifice plate. So if we now return to the equation we had earlier, we had the velocity out being equal to a term, which was the square root of 2 divided by density, pressure difference divided by 1 minus area out divided by area in squared. What we want to do is we want to replace the values for the pressure in and pressure out with P1 and P2, because those are the pressures that we are using for the orifice meter. And we will replace the out and the in for the areas in the same fashion, so that we now have area 2 divided by area 1. From that equation, which we're calling equation 4, we can now define G, which is going to be the mass flow rate, and sometimes that's written as a m dot, which is equal to the density multiplied by velocity, which in our case is the velocity of interest, V2, multiplied by area 2. And we will take that and substitute it into equation 4, so that we now have an equation G, or m dot, the mass flow rate, is equal to a density times area 2, multiplied by the square root of the same thing that we had before in equation 4, and that we will call equation 5. What we now need to look at is what exactly is this area 2? So area 2, we said, was the diameter, or it's going to be the area, rather, of the vena contractor. But unfortunately, the diameter of this vena contractor is not easy, easily measured. So therefore, what we're going to do is define a coefficient of contraction. CC, so the coefficient of contraction, which is going to be equal to area 2 divided by area O, or naught, the orifice plate diameter, area rather. So what that means is we can rearrange that to have area 2 is equal to the coefficient of contraction multiplied by area O. We can then substitute that into equation 5. So we now have an equation where we have the coefficient of contraction multiplied by area O, or the area of the orifice meter, instead of area 2. And now hopefully... We will be able to measure that area because that's an orifice plate or an orifice meter that we installed, so we will know the area of A0. What you are going to find in some textbooks is that this equation is now rewritten such that it has alpha terms. So there's alpha 2, alpha 1 that come popping back into this equation here. So some of you may recall or you may have seen elsewhere that kinetic energy EK is equal to half mv squared. And sometimes it's rewritten, or it's written rather, with an alpha in front of it, or behind it. So the alpha is a 1, or an alpha is a 2, depending whether this is laminar or turbulent flow. So turbulent flow for the 1, and laminar flow for the 2. So I'm reintroducing these terms simply so that you can see what our next step is, or in case you see this in a textbook and wonder where these alphas come from. So then to take into account all those alphas and the CC term, we're now going to replace all of those terms with a single factor, and we're going to call this CD, which is going to be the coefficient of discharge. And as with many engineering terms, we're now going to obtain CD from a graph. So we're lucky enough that somebody else has calculated this for us, and we can go to this graph, which will be given in a test or an exam, or find in the notes, and we can use this to find the CD. So this CD value, or this chart rather, is giving us the value of CD against a Reynolds number on the x-axis, and it's going to give us the CD value up on the y-axis. Now to note on this, this is for a sharp-edged orifice, and it needs to have a diameter ratio where the orifice diameter divided by the inside diameter is going to give you some value, which we will then read 
of this graph here. So let's just say for argument's sake that we have a value of 0 0.75 for an example. So if we have the diameter ratios of that, we will now be looking at this curve here. You will need to work out your Reynolds number. So we said Reynolds was equal to rho v d on mu. So please calculate rho v d on mu. Whatever your value is, you will then read up to the graph. You will read to the left and you will find a CD value in this instance somewhere just above 0 0.8. However, we are now going to have a bit of a problem because if you've noticed the Reynolds number that we need, and that is the Reynolds number through the orifice, please just remember that it's through the orifice, not the pipe. In order to get that, we are going to need the velocity. However, the whole aim of this exercise was to determine the mass flow rate through the pipe or through the orifice plate, and the mass flow rate will then give us the velocity. So if we don't have the mass flow rate, we're not going to be able to get the velocity in order to get the Reynolds number, which we need for the coefficient of discharge. If we don't... In order to solve this, this is going to become an iterative problem. The first step that we are going to do is going to be to guess a value of CD. So the value that you're going to guess needs to be something that's reasonable. So something that's reasonable is the maximum point is on the right hand side of X, sorry, is going to be something about 0.6. And the value at the top here for this graph is about 0.98. So any reasonable value between those, the arrow there, that is going to be our first guess for CD. So that is going to be step one. From that guess, we are now going to calculate the mass flow rate using that guessed CD. We can then calculate the mass flow rate, and from that we can then get a velocity. From that velocity, we can now calculate a Reynolds number, which we can then use on this graph, and we can work out what the actual Reynolds number is to work up back to the actual line that we're working with, and then to the left to determine the real CD value. With that new CD value, we are going to again calculate the mass flow rate because the CD value is probably different. From that calculated mass value, we will then recalculate the velocity and recalculate the Reynolds number, and you will iterate this until the velocity and the Reynolds number or the CD value are constant. When the CD value is constant, that is when you can stop and you've calculated your mass flow rate. The other common problem that I could give you in an exam is for you to calculate the area of the orifice meter required in order to get a certain flow rate from a certain pressure drop. As you can see, the area in this is given twice. So first of all, we are going to have the same problem as we had before in terms of determining the Reynolds number through the orifice because Reynolds number is rho v d on mu. If you don't have the area of the orifice, you also don't have the diameter of the orifice. So again, you're going to need to solve this iteratively. However, the second problem is because we have got the two a noughts, we now need to make a plan on how to simplify this equation. The first option is to try and somehow simplify this equation in such a way that you can get rid of 2 a noughts and simply have an equation where you have a naught is equal to something on the right. Or the second option is some other plan. The first, well not the first, and the way to do that is to look at this in terms of a naught divided by a1. If a naught divided by a1, or sorry, if a naught, if a naught, let's write that down, if a naught is much, much smaller than a1. From that, the term a naught divided by a1 will become 0. So therefore, 1 minus a naught on a1 will become 1. So if we have that, the entire bottom section of this equation falls away. So we then have a single a naught in our equation. If that is true, we can then use that fact and we can simplify this equation, as we said, to do just that part of the equation. To solve this then, we are going to solve for the mass, well, no, sorry, not mass flow rate, solve for a naught. And again, you're only going to need to iterate for the Reynolds number, but we do not know if a naught divided by a1 is truly naught. So what you need to do is you need to reintroduce the bottom half of this equation. 
So we now have our original A0 is going to be an initial guess, and we're going to call it A0-1. That A0-1 we will substitute in the bottom of this equation, and we will now resolve for the A0 outside the square root term. So we will solve for A0-2. From that, we will take this A0-2, substitute it into the bottom, and we will carry on solving this as A0-3, a0-4, the whole time looking at the Reynolds number and iterating for the CD value at the same time. This technique here should be, you should remember this from the direct substitution that we did in the numerical method section. So it's the same approach as we are using here. You may also see a different form of this equation, such that the pressure is recorded as a GH term. So we remember that pressure, or delta pressure, was written as rho gh. So in this instance, we're not worried about the delta rho, it's just written as rho gh, which we can then take this delta pressure and substitute it into the equation for rho gh. You will then see that we now have a pressure in the pressure term, sorry, a density in the pressure term, and we have a density outside. Please remember that there are different densities, the one on the left-hand side or the top at the moment, that is the density of the fluid. The density for the pressure is going to be the density of the manometer. There are some examples where there is only one density. For those, they assume that the densities are the same and that the density of the manometer is the same as the density of the fluid. What they have done there is they have taken the delta P equation and they've written delta P is equal to rho GH, and that is from the manometer fluid, and we're then saying that that is equal to some theoretical value for a density of the fluid multiplied by GH. The H's, however, are going to be different, so that's an H of the manometer and an H of this fluid, if that were physically possible. So if you see this equation where there isn't an F or an M, there's just a single density, please make sure that you use the correct H term.